while we wait for the last last few people to trickle in, uh, I'm, I'm going to. Hi, my name is Amy, uh, and as I've just said, I have come from Perth this week, uh, and really excited to be. Here. Although you could have put on some nicer weather for us. Uh, however, Perth has had about five days above. So this is actually kind of refreshing for me to, to not step outside and immediately feel like dying. So that's really nice. Uh, I also want to thank you all for coming to my talk. I know there was a lot of choice between me giving a talk about GitHub and a guy from GitHub giving a talk about GitHub and a guy from GitHub giving a talk about something else, but GitHub will probably be mentioned. And I, I don't know, I'm just going to assume that the other speakers will also mention GitHub at some point uh, during this session. So a lot of options for, for this slot. So hi, my name is Amy, and I'm going to be talking about front-end testing with GitHub Actions. First off, I, I'm not going to delve too much into why we need to be testing or why we need to test the front-end applications. Uh, if you're here or if you're watching this video at home afterwards, I'm going to assume that you already know that testing is important. Uh, if you don't know why we need to test or you aren't yet convinced that it's important, I have another talk for you in 2020 at NDC Sydney. Uh, I, well, at virtually, uh, I gave a talk about the whys and hows of front-end testing. Uh, so you can check that out if you still need convincing about why testing is important. If you're testing, I'm trying to make sure my mic is working. Uh, if you are testing the front-end of your website, you need a functioning front-end to test. You need a live website. Uh, unlike running other tests like unit tests uh, where you can give it dummy data and confirm that it spits out the same result, front-end testing needs a functioning front-end. For example, if you look at this beautiful code, can any of you it accessible to anybody with a vision impairment? Can you work out how fast the page is going to render or if any of the resources are going to block the page loading? If you look at this as code snippet, can you tell me if any of the code changes are going to bleed out to another part of the application or if it's only going to affect what you intended to? As the name suggests, front-end testing needs a functioning front-end to test against. While we can perform some linting and validation against the code we've written, there's only so much that we can determine without seeing the final product. Ideally, this is as close to production as possible. In particular, for testing, you kind of want to test against the same specs that production is going to have. So why GitHub Actions, you ask? You know, other than the fact that apparently everyone's talking about GitHub at the moment, like literally right now. Uh, this is a really great question that I want to ask, that I want to address in two parts. First off, manual tests are better than nothing but they aren't great because it's hard to ensure that they're being run. How many of you enjoy doing a repetitive task that can easily be automated, but still doing it manually? None of you like into that. But none of us enjoy doing that. This is why we love having AI because we can get computers to do it for us. Automation adds consistency, and when tests are automated as part of any kind of process, it means it's actually going to happen. Uh, it adds a check to make sure that we're actually running our tests, and when the pipeline is set up properly, we can ensure that the code that we, we can ensure that the code that we write can pass tests and doesn't get merged in, protecting the quality of our application. But why did I choose GitHub Actions specifically to use for running tests and particular CI CD tool? For me, it was a personal choice. The documentation and support available to me was good and it meant it wasn't hard for me to get started. Uh, also free, which was slight contributing factor. Uh, it was also compatible with a lot of existing things and that I was going to want to do and has great extensibility. So it works for small 
personal projects and works well for bigger enterprise projects. So one concept I can spread across different kinds of projects. And while the code and conventions that we're going to be looking at today are specific to GitHub Actions, the concepts and practices are ones that you can take and reuse in your own tools and processes. Clicker has decided to die. All right. For those who aren't familiar with or haven't heard of GitHub Actions, uh, which I'm going to assume you've at least heard of it because it's literally in the title of my talk, as a very powerful could do a whole other talk on the capabilities. Uh, if you want to look at it more, I recommend checking out the docs. You can literally Google GitHub Actions and there'll be a million blog posts out there. Or have a chat to some of the lovely people from GitHub who are here this week. We're talking right now uh, and there's another one who'll be floating around. Uh, so see if you can track one of them down and they may be answer more questions. I want to quickly check as well. I've, it sounds to me like the mic is dropping in and out. I just want to check that I'm good before we only have like half of the audio for this. Yeah. Now, GitHub Actions runs what are called workflows, and these are written inside of workflow files inside, inside a particular folder of your project, .github slash workflows. Uh, and as with a lot of DevOps tools, these files are written in YAML. Yay. Love working with YAML. YAML's the best. Look at that a little bit more later on. Its job is then made up, workflows jobs, uh, its job is then made up of a number of steps uh, which will run one after another. Each workflow looks a little bit I want to really apologize for this. I should have checked this. That is really not easy to read. I will share the slides out later on uh, for anybody who can't quite see that. Uh, and please feel free to move if uh, you want to be able to read that. Uh, each work is a nice user-friendly name. This is for us to recognize what workflow is being run. Uh, we also information about how the workflow is being triggered. In this case, uh, every time a pull request opened, reopened, all the on the PR gets updated. Now, these are just a few of the many options available to trigger GitHub Action Workflow. Uh, for example, if you create or delete a branch or tag, uh, if you create a deployment, if somebody creates updates, a discussion, some about issues, PRs, comments, projects, workflow, you can literally trigger a GitHub action from when a different GitHub action runs. There are plenty of options available for how we can trigger actions. These then have further options. For example, the pull request trigger allows us to define different kinds of pull request related events that can trigger the workflow, uh, whether all of them trigger it or just ones that involve the code being changed. Uh, so for example, maybe if a pull request is assigned, flow, reopened, if you turn on auto merge, plenty of options. We can also then filter specific branches, production, development, feature branches, what branches, when a PR is submitted to what branches workflow run, uh, can include wildcard branch names as well if you have specific conventions. Uh, we can also then filter down to certain, certain specific files. For example, maybe you have a workflow that should only run if a JavaScript file been changed and you're going to go through and lint and format JavaScript. For this case this morning though, uh, we're going to keep it simple. We want to trigger this for pull requests. Uh, in particular, we want to trigger this if a pull request is opened, reopened or synchronized. This means any time code in a pull request has been changed. We also only want to run this code when a pull request 
is made to the production branch. So I don't care about the rest of the branches. I only care about the code that's coming into production. The entire workflow complete time a different unique name, uh, in this case, build. Uh, this name must be unique, uh, and this is one that we can refer to in sections of our workflow. Form the workflow is going to run on. Uh, there are windows. going to run on some kind of uh, you then each job has a number of to complete these will run one after is going to be repo uh, otherwise you don't have anything to work with if we have the steps uh, each step will typically have a name this is for, I, again a person friendly name so set up node or run script uh, can also have a unique id this is optional and allows us to refer to a step elsewhere uh, we can define what a step does in two different ways one is by using a github actions package these are a bunch of predefined packages that we can choose from for example there is one to set up node which as the name suggests will set up node for us. Uh, there are literally tens of thousands of packages out there, so there's plenty of options for us to use. Uh, otherwise, we can define run, which allows us to go through and run a custom script in the GitHub Actions terminal. Uh, some actions uh, we can also go through and define certain criteria that must be met. For example, we could have an action that only runs if our GitHub action has failed. So if it failed, it might send a notification to Slack or Discord or Teams or send an SMS or a carrier pigeon or something to tell somebody something has gone wrong, you need to deal with it. Uh, workflows will often then have environment variables that we need. We can define specific environment variables uh, as with environment variables, these are secrets. So we're probably referring to secrets that we've set up elsewhere in GitHub, which we're going to look at in a second. Uh, then we can have some not secret properties that we pass in. Uh, this gives us additional information or context to the actions being run. For example, the setup node action, we need to tell it what version of node we're wanting to use. Uh, GitHub script, we need to give it the script that we're wanting it to run. So you can see lots of options that we can go through and do. For now, we're just going to have three steps to get started. Each of these steps has a name. Uh, we're going to check out the repo code, then we're going to set up Node, and then we're going to install Node modules. Uh, first of all, we're going to use the checkout action, which checks out our repo code. We're then going to use the setup node action, and then we're going to run npm install to install our node modules. Uh, and again, setup node, we need to tell it which version of node we want it to use. When we have workflow files as part of our repo, we can find them in the GitHub dashboard under the actions tab. So that's inside your repo under actions. And when I open a PR, to merge code into my production branch, uh, it will now trigger my actions workflow to run. So we can see here, clearly real time, not remotely sped up. Uh, it will go through and run my action. It will check out the code, uh, it will set up node, and then we'll install node modules. Uh, once everything's installed, the next step is to build and deploy our website to a staging environment. As I said, probably the same one that we're going to use in produ production. Well, not, not the production environment, but should be set up as close to production as possible. In this case, I'm hosting my site on Netlify. 
uh, which is really great because they have a deploy preview feature so I can have a fully functioning live version of my website with a URL that I can access and it doesn't affect the production version until I'm ready to merge it in. Uh, this step is going to be slightly different depending on where you're hosting it. The concepts will be the same and there are plenty of existing action packages that you can use, whether you're hosting it on Netlify or GitHub Pages or Azure or AWS or whatever cloud you've got it on, uh, there will be an option for this for you. Uh, in my case, there are a few existing Netlify build and deploy actions. However, I couldn't find anything that worked exactly for what I wanted. Uh, so I did what all good developers do, and rather than use a pre-existing tool, I built a custom script to do it myself. Uh, so uh, I made a Netlify deploy shell script, uh, which I saved inside uh, an actions folder in my .github folder. You can save it wherever you want, but I just kind of wanted to keep it all in the same place. Uh, thankfully, Netlify has a CLI tool, which made this super easy. So to set up the bash script. Uh, here we have the command to go through and run. Uh, we've got Netlify deploy. I want it to build the site, pass in the site ID, my authentication token, and I want it to give me the results in JSON format afterwards. Next, I want to go through and run the command and save the output of the command in a variable. I then want to go through and pass that output. And one of the pieces that Netlify will give me of that output is the deploy URL. So I want to save that specific URL. And lastly, I want to take that URL and I can, I can set that to the GitHub output, uh, which is where I can save bits of data associated with my actions workflow that I can refer to elsewhere, which we'll go through and have a look at in a second. So my step, deploy to Netlify. Uh, I have an ID because I want to be able to refer to this later on. That ID is build site. Uh, I'm going to pass in my environment variables. So I have my authentication token and the ID of my site. And then I want to go through and run my custom script. Lastly, this is the bit that I always forget to do. It always runs and then throws a massive tantrum. I need to actually make sure that I set my secret variables so that the GitHub Actions can use them. So under Settings, Secrets and Variables, Actions, uh, I can go through and set my secret values uh, so that I can refer to them in the action uh, and without accidentally putting API keys in my public code because, you know, that would be silly and no one would ever do that. Uh, once that's done, uh, I can then submit another PR to production and watch my action run. While this works, uh, I can then check in Netlify and find out the URL of my preview site so I can see that it has deployed. It's successful. I got a little green tick. Uh, however, I don't want to have to go to Netlify to get the URL. I need to be able to refer back to it, which we've already saved it. So once the site is built, we can then use the GitHub's, so the site's built, uh, we can then use the GitHub scripts package to add a comment to our PR so that we know that everything's built and to easily find the preview URL. Uh, most of the information for the script uh, is about the repo that we're on. Uh, the who owns the repo, their issue number, which in this case is our PR number, uh, and gives some context about where we are and what we're doing. Um, we also then want to give the body for the comment, which in this case is just going to spit out the URL. Uh, so for this, we're referring to our build site step that has just happened. This is where we built our site. And we can then go for, through and refer to that. So steps dot build site, which is our unique step ID, dot outputs, dot Netlify URL. So that's the output variable that we set in the custom script. Once again, permissions. Did not remotely spend several hours 
while writing this talk because I couldn't work out why it wasn't working. Uh, we also need to give our GitHub Actions workflow permission to do stuff with our GitHub repo. So we need to make sure that we give it read and write permissions so that it can add comments to our PR. Otherwise, it doesn't work and the error message is very silent and not overly useful. So make sure that we're giving permission for it to do things. Once this is set up, we can run the workflow again. And this time we get a comment added to our, our PR that says it works and this is the URL that we can visit. And in case anybody doesn't believe me, that is still a fully functioning live URL where we can have a look at this specific version of the website at that point in time. Now we talked about how this build step is specific to Netlify because that's where I'm hosting my website, but you can deploy this anywhere. For example, we've just built on Netlify. I could also add an extra step to build and deploy on Azure if I wanted. Uh, for this, uh, I want to build and deploy. Uh, this is the Azure build and deploy. And in this case, Azure has a GitHub Actions package that I can use. So I can use the Azure static web apps deploy package. Uh, I want to pass in some special variables again. So this is my API token to deploy to Azure uh, and the GitHub token. So it's got permission to make a comment on my repo. Uh, and then pass in some information about how it's building and deploying. So where in the repo it exists and the script that it runs to build and what the name of the deployed folder should be. Then now when my website builds, I have two comments, one from the script that we set up, which gives me a Netlify URL, and then one from the Azure deploy script, which gives me my Azure deploy preview. Uh, so we're now able to actually deploy in multiple locations all in the one workflow. Now that we have a functioning live URL of our website, we can go through and start running tests on it. So we have our, we have our build job already existing. So I also then want to create a test job. So I want to keep the tests a little bit separate from build. Uh, like the build job, I want to go through and run that on Linux. I use Ubuntu because what I've used, it works. It's easy. Uh, but you can use a variety of different options. Uh, I then want to go through and in my build job, I want to set an output on the job. So again, our deploy URL that we took from the build step. I want to set, then set that as an output on the build job so I can refer to that in the test job. I need to be able to refer to that live URL. So I want to set the output for deploy URL. Uh, then in the test job, I need to make build a dependency on test. If build hasn't worked, I can't run tests. I don't have anything to run tests against. So I can set build as a dependency of test then if it doesn't work, it won't run the tests. Uh, then because the test job is an entirely new setup in there, I also then want to go through and check out my repo code because it's the first thing I need to do. First test I'm going to go through and run is Lighthouse, mainly because it's super easy to start spinning up. Uh, so first I'm going to use the Lighthouse CI action package, there's like 50 different Lighthouse GitHub Actions packages, so choose the one you like. Uh, and again, I have a nice user-friendly name. This is auditing URLs using Lighthouse. I uh, want to pass in some and settings. Uh, in this case, I want to set a setting for upload artifacts. What it's going to do is it's actually going to upload the report results at the end so I can access them. Uh, and then I want to give it the URL, my deploy URL of the website. Uh, so I'm going to pass in, that's the URL it's going to run the test against. Uh, one slight issue with this though, uh, which again was super fun because I'd forgotten about it until I wrote this talk, 
Uh, so GitHub Actions does this really smart thing where because you're passing information back and forth and it's available in logs, which might be publicly available logs, uh, it has this super useful feature where if you have any secret variables that are accidentally being put out in the log or being passed back and forth between things, uh, it will just remove them so that you don't accidentally reveal your secrets. Uh, while this is a useful feature, uh, it is incredibly sensitive about what it thinks might be a secret uh, and it isn't really loud about the fact that it's done it. There's like a teeny tiny little log. So I have my little logs that when I finish the build script, it's not even an error, it's a warning. It says, warning, we're not going to set the output for deploy URL because it might contain a secret. Uh, so because uh, the deploy preview often has a randomly generated string so that it's unique associated with it, uh, this looks like an API token. This looks like a secret thing. So GitHub goes, this might be a secret. We're just not going to do it. But also we just, we just very quietly whisper, that might be a secret. Might be a secret. Uh, I spent far too many hours trying to work out why my actions weren't working, uh, why variables didn't exist or weren't set, uh, only to find these teeny tiny little notes. Uh, and apparently I'm not alone because there is a lot of very upset people on the internet about this feature. Uh, to get around this, we can encode the URL before we pass it through uh, and then have uh, an encoded URL that we can access. So inside the Netlify deploy script, we were already setting the output of the Netlify URL. Uh, I also then want to set my encoded URL, uh, which I'm going to base64 encode it twice, just in case. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then pass that one through. And so that one, that one's definitely not going to maybe be a secret. Uh, then once we get to our test job, so we've checked out the repo code, and then going to add a step to decode the URL, uh, and I'm going to go through and then unencode my base64 encoded uh, URL again twice. <laughs> Couldn't work out why it was wasn't doing it. I actually asked GitHub Copilot chat. I was like, "Why is this not working?" And said, "Well, you decoded, you encoded it twice, but you only encoded it once, so it's still encoded." Uh, which is super useful. Uh, once we do that, I can then go through and I'm just going to double check that this deploy URL is still what I was expecting. Uh, and uh, it is, it's all good. So we can go through and encode it and decode it and then GitHub lets us pass it through because, you know, logic, secrets and stuff. So once we've decoded our URL, we can now pass that decoded URL into the Lighthouse step. Uh, we can give it the decoded URL, so steps.decodeurl.outputs, deploy URL. Uh, and now, now we can go through and run the Lighthouse test. Uh, as I said, uh, we wanted it to upload the results of the test. Uh, as with a lot of testing tools, particularly for front-end tests, it will generate the uh, report so that we can see the results of it a bit, little bit better. Uh, we it will take these generated reports and upload them as assets that we can reference so they can be accessed later or passed along to other team members or something. Uh, again, this is coming from the upload artifacts property, which, which we've set to be true. And this will give us a nice little report, which tells me that the performance sucks. Who would have thought I wasn't going to spend a lot of time building a test website to do a talk on, but apparently I should have listened to Mandy's talk yesterday and fixed my HTML performance. I'll do that for the next time. So here I have a nice HTML report which I can download, I can access, and I can pass it to other people of the team and go, you need to fix your HTML performance because this is not, this is not good. Once I've done that, I want to go through and do some more tests. So in this case, I want to use Playwright because Playwright's fun to use. Uh, anybody who hasn't used Playwright before, highly recommend checking it out, uh, especially if you've used Cypress or Selenium. Playwright is so much nicer to use. Uh, for this, I want to go through and install my Playwright dependencies. 
Uh, then want to go through and run the playwright tests. Again, I need to pass in the URL of the website that I'm using. Uh, and in this case, I'm just going to run the script uh, for playwright. Then I need to go through and actually upload the report myself in this case, because I'm just running scripts in the terminal. Uh, I want to go through and use the upload artifact package. And I want this to happen all the time. So by default, if a step fails, it won't keep doing the other steps. But in this case, I want to set the condition for if always. So whether the previous steps have passed or failed, always do this. This means if the tests I'm running pass, it will upload my successful report. And if the tests fail, it will upload the failed report. So whatever happens, upload my report. Uh, I'm going to pass in my playwright report, path playwright report, whatever settings you've got there. Uh, and I also want to set the retention to be 30 days. We don't want to keep these things hanging around forever, but you want to, you know, not have the thing that you got yesterday and already you've lost it because you forgot to download it. So this will give me a nice little report, which says the playwright tests have run. Playwright tests have run successfully because, of course, all of our tests pass, right? We make sure that all of our code is successful and our tests pass every time. Uh, and so we can download this report uh, and have a look through it, same as the Lighthouse report. So now all of our tests have passed. We have nice green ticks in our PR, which says we've checked everything, everything's all good to go. Uh, you can merge it in. But once we merge it in, we actually want to be able to do something with our now tested production code that we are confident is going to be all good. So we can also build a GitHub Actions workflow to build and publish uh, once the code has moved in. So this is our build and publish workflow. We're starting a brand new workflow this time. Uh, and this one should be triggered if code is pushed to the production branch. So if a PR is merged in and there's new code on production, this will be triggered. Uh, if you push directly to production, which no one in this room would ever do not once, uh, this will also trigger it to happen. We then want to go through and run a build job, set up uh, where we're going to be running it on, and then set up our build steps. So our build steps, very similar to testing uh, and building previously. We need to check out the code. We want to set up Node. Uh, we want to run npm install. Uh, and then we want to deploy to Netlify again. Uh, so I want to deploy to Netlify, want to pass in my tokens and the site ID, same as we did previously, and then go through and run the custom script. But in this case, I want to tell the custom script that I'm deploying to Netlify. So I'm going to pass in uh, a production flag which in this case is P. P is true, which means production. And then I want to go through and modify my deploy script. Uh, and where previously, right after I set the script, I want to check uh, if I've set the production flag. Uh, I want to save it. And then if production is true, I want to append my command with Netlify's production flag because, you know, not remotely super complicated, but uh, then again, I set the output of the command same as previously. So we can go through and if I've set the production flag, it's going to do production build. If not, it's just going to do a deploy preview. I now have two GitHub Actions workflows, which I can find in my repo. So I now have build and test and build and publish. Uh, so this will then go through and depending on which criteria I met, it will run the different workflows when they're triggered. So we have built and can preview our website from anywhere, anywhere we like. This isn't on a local server. It's not on a VPN. It's not running on Steve's computer, which doesn't work anywhere else. Uh, we can build and preview our website from anywhere. Uh, we can then test our live website. These, these are just two tests that we quickly set up, but we can go through and run any tests that we need to and run them against our life, almost production website. Uh, and lastly, once we've tested our code and we are 110% sure that that's not remotely going to break production, uh, we can build and publish it, even, even on Fridays. That's how good our tests are. We can build, publish, and deploy on, fri on Fridays. Uh, now, GitHub Actions isn't just for testing, as 
the name of this talk suggests, we are talking a lot about testing. Uh, but there are so many other things that we can do with GitHub Actions. Uh, I had a look at the number this morning, uh, and there's like 20, almost 22,000 Actions packages. Uh, and, that's, and that's on top of, you know, just literally running any script that you want. Uh, these are pre-built Actions packages ready for us to be able to use, which means we can set up other automations to run as part of our workflow. For example, who likes to leave comments in their code, the things we have to do later? <coughs> who maybe forgets <laughs> that there's things <laughs> that we were going to fix? Um, I do this. Occasionally, very occasionally. Um, however, I'm clearly not alone. Uh, and before I deploy my website, uh, I can actually add an extra package, which is to do to issue action. And what this will do is this searches through all of my code uh, that I'm deploying to production. We'll find all of my to-do comments uh, and create them as issues. And so we'll add issues from all of my comments. Uh, I can then pass in some extra properties and settings that I want to use. For example, uh, auto assign, whoever wrote the code, whoever wrote the comment, assign the issue to them. It's very probably their problem to fix. Uh, this is super useful for my own personal repos where it's literally just my problem to fix. Uh, we can also then set up close issues. Uh, what this does is if the comment is removed, it assumes that the issue has been fixed uh, and it will automatically close the issue, which is super useful to not have to then, just because we left a comment yesterday, then immediately went through and fixed the thing, it knows we've fixed it and will close it for us. So we can go through and do that. And then if I have, if I have a comment that says, okay, my production command is broken, uh, I'm going to fix that later. Uh, I can add my little comment. And then when I push to production, uh, when I push all my code in, it will go through and run. It will go through and run the script. Uh, and I now have an issue on my repo that says I have to fix the production command. And that will automatically get assigned to me. When I remove the, the comment from the code, uh, it knows I've fixed it and it will close it for me. So that's pretty cool. Uh, as I said, so this will then auto assign and we'll close it when the code changes. Uh, there are, as I said, there's a heap of other things that we can go through and do uh, as part of GitHub Actions workflows. For example, uh, we can create tasks and issues for any comments or bugs. Uh, we can lint or validate our code. Uh, we can check for broken links. So we can do this in the code, but now that we have a functioning live version of our website, we can do it there as well. Uh, there is a manual approval step. Uh, so we can set that this point, there needs to be a manual approval from certain people, or you can actually wait a specified time before continuing. So like once code merge is into production, you can say it will deploy five days later, unless one of these two people manually approves it earlier. Uh, you can go through and generate assets that you're using. Uh, for example, I have a GitHub action which searches for Twitter embeds and generates a static image of the Twitter embed and replaces it in my blog post. So I just have a static image. I'm not having to refer to other things. Uh, and it's it's great for if anything happens with Twitter and all the embeds break. Uh, so I can go through and do that. Uh, you might like to dynamically generate a social media preview image for blog posts or for individual pages. You can do this uh, as part of an actions workflow. Uh, it's not just about the code either. You can automate setting properties on a PR. Uh, you can uh, approve collaborators, you can close stale issues, uh, any number of things to do with your repo you can set up as a GitHub action. Uh, I'm even working on an action at the moment that summarizes 
any changes to environment variables file. Uh, so it summarizes which ones have changed, which ones have been added and removed. So if you're occasionally working on a project that other people are working on, when you pull down the code, you can get a summary of, okay, since I last did this, these four environment variables have been added, this one's been removed, and this one's had a value changed, which means you don't have to go through and try and run and then work out what it is you're missing. You can go, hey, I need these things. These are the things that I need now. All of the code that we have gone through today uh, is available on GitHub. Uh, it's in my repo, front-end testing, uh, and it's available as a resource with the slides when I share them out afterwards. Uh, so this includes the workflow files that we did, the custom scripts that we set up to run as well. Uh, I also have a blog post, front-end testing with GitHub Actions, which uh, inspired this talk, uh, so it steps through a lot of the same stuff. And uh, if you're still not convinced that testing the front end of your applications is important, uh, have my talk, uh, wait, I have to test the front end too, from Andy C. Sydney in 2020. Thank you very much for coming uh, along today. Uh, it has been lovely having you here. Uh, it's lovely to be back in Sydney. Uh, you can find my slides online uh, and I will share them in Slack afterwards. Uh, and I also, there's a colored cards at the back, but if you would like to give me any feedback afterwards uh, about anything that I may not have covered or if you had any questions or something you'd like to know more about, there's a form where you can do so. Thank you very much for coming along. I think I do have time for questions as well. If anyone had any? I am around for the rest of the comp. Oh, sorry, I did get a hand. Sorry, um, so in the example with, um, I guess, that computer in the slide, um, might be a bit out of scope of like the dynamic one, so we get more reliant on the Atom servers as an API. Do you have any tips for like how you can stop it and stop getting too crazy? Like, tips for dynam dynamically generated sites um, with APIs and stuff like that. Um, not too sure. I mean, in the ideal situation, you would also have a staging version of the APIs that you would be referring to. And so uh, you would be referring to that in um, that version. Honestly, I'm not, I don't know if I could give too much advice on that one because I've not done too many of those projects. Um, yeah. Sorry, that's not my. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It is. It is a bit of a tricky one. Um, I think the advantage of this. This is a. <laughs> this is a statically generated site, uh, but because we're because we're deploying a version of it, you could just have a version, whether it's referencing a staging version of an API or something else, or whether it's actually worth referencing the production version. Um, prob probably not referencing the production version if you're making changes to the API, though, just if it's consuming it. Uh, you should still be able to, to set that up to do it and still run the test against it the same way. Um, off the top of my head, I'd be inclined to ask, like, if, if flakiness is an issue with a staging version, then is it an issue with production? Uh, and so that, but I suppose that's probably why you're wanting to run front-end tests is to test, you know, is, is the performance not great? Um, yeah, I'm not, otherwise I'm not too sure on that one. Interesting question, though. Might have to look into it. Stay tuned. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, so I'm not a physician yet, I'm a dev, so just let me know if my question doesn't make sense, but uh, is there a world where you use GitHub Actions to test uh, your website code that can be used for like testing? So you don't have a live website? Yes, absolutely. Um, so anything up until our build step, uh, our build and deploy step, you can, so like linting and um, sort of that kind of code checking, yeah. Any of that stuff. So anything up until where you deploy the preview of the website, you can go through and run the code. So there's a heap of actions packages for linting. So just checking the code, formatting it, making changes, that kind of thing. Uh, if you're running uh, like 
end-to-end -end testing or uh, anything like the component testing, uh, just run it the same way you normally would on your computer. Um, because you've got the terminal set up there, uh, you can just go through and run any of the tests that you're wanting to the same you would normally. Uh, it's just that the front-end test that we looked at because you need that live URL version. Um, but yeah, otherwise the GitHub Actions workflow, you can set up, you set up the environment the, the way you want it to and so you can just run the test the same way you normally would. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. How does GitHub Actions verify? Um, I actually have no idea on that one. That would probably be one that I would recommend chatting with one of the wonderful people from GitHub here today. Uh, but that's a really good question. I'm, I'm probably going to have to find out about that uh, because I'm working on some actions that I don't know I might share with people. Um, I'm not too sure. I'd, I'd assume it'd be sort of a little bit similar to NPM and kind of Anyone could put stuff on there, but they just don't guarantee that the code's trustworthy. I know there are some, so there's like a, there's a filter setting for verified. So these are, these are verified people that, I think they still don't guarantee it. These are like, these are verified people. We can't guarantee the code won't be dodgy, but it's probably fine. I think like Microsoft is a verified uh, add-on maintainer. So they're like, we don't guarantee it, but probably going to be okay with that. Hopefully no one from Microsoft's in the audience. It's fine. Um, any other questions? Yep. Uh, also, um, on the front end testing, right? Uh, what do you think uh, are the areas that we need to cover so if we need like to do this kind of automated front end testing? Like is it easily and what I have to do like uh, to create the semantic like the next product and then we need like some of the buttons to make it like go more smooth, right? Um, what when we are automating What other front end tests should we be doing and what should we should be looking for? Um, that's a really great question. I would first of all like to refer you to my previous talk that I recommended <laughs> where we talked about front end testing. Um, so in, in, in particular, the areas I recommend are accessibility, performance, and UI. Uh, so performance, again, I've, I'm not going to delve into why you need to be looking at performance. Uh, accessibility, uh, also super important. Uh, if you're not convinced, I recommend checking out Jess's talk tomorrow on accessibility, in particular uh, accessibility with single page applications. Uh, and UI testing is one that I do a, a fair bit of. It's, so that's what I use Playwright for. Uh, so it's great if you've already got any other Playwright tests. Uh, so go through and check Check that people can use the website the way that you're expecting them to. Can they click on the things that, that you want them to click on? Can they fill in forms? Can they submit things? Can they find things? Are things where they're supposed to be and do they do what they're supposed to do? Uh, so just going through and making sure that you haven't accidentally hidden a button behind something else so that they can't do it. Uh, you haven't accidentally set up, uh, try to fill out a form for, uh, to hire a car when we're going on holiday uh, and it wouldn't submit the form because it said one of the required fields wasn't filled in. Uh, and so I opened up in incognito rather than being signed into my account uh, to see what the issue was. When I'm logged in, that field doesn't exist. It's not even hidden. It doesn't exist in the DOM. But their validation said it wasn't filled in. Uh, so just making sure that you're not preventing people from being able to do the things that they need to do. Uh, so going through and using that. Um, that was one of the other, you know, I didn't delve into it uh, today, uh, but I have a really great workshop on it uh, where we delve more into the playwright UI testing. They have a, I forget the name of it, but it will basically spin up a version of the website and you can use it. You click through and you navigate through and you fill in the inputs and you do what you're wanting people to be able to do and it writes the tests for it. It's amazing. I love it. It's so much nicer than trying to write simple user interface 
testing. Uh, so that's one of the ones that I really recommend doing. Uh, but otherwise, it really depends on your use case. Like, for example, accessibility testing, I think everyone should do it. I think, I think it's an important thing for everyone to consider. But it then depends on your specific user base, whether or not that's really important. For example, if you're building a product for people with impairments, that's it's not going to be a non-negotiable for you. That's absolutely something that you're doing. Um, performance testing. Uh, I've had discussions with clients who <laughs> their websites weren't great. And I went, you do realize 90% of your customer base are farmers out in the country with like no internet on their phones. Like this is they don't care about the really nice image on the homepage. They just want to find the information about their tractor. Um, so it, it would then just depend on your use case, what you think is important. But basic uh, performance accessibility and UI testing, great way to get started and, and then building it out from there. There's one of the, I, I have mixed feelings about the Lighthouse testing, but it does kind of give you a good, good place to get started on. Yep. Any other questions? If anybody does have any other questions, please feel free to come and find me at some point during the rest of the conference. I will, I will be around for most of the rest of the next two days. Is this actually gone to sleep? Uh, I, I will be around for most of the uh, next couple of days. If you have any questions or if you want to have a chat about anything, um, apart from at some point, uh, I'm going to go to the Lego store because it's the biggest Lego store in the Southern Hemisphere and I'm <laughs> super excited. Not remotely why I was so excited to come to NDC Sydney. Um, just a bonus point. Uh, so thank you very much for coming along to my talk. I uh, hope you had a great time uh, and I'll see you around for the rest of the conference.